I've always been interested in taxonomy, the systematic classification of life. That was the very first evidence of evolution, and I think it's still the strongest, but I've often said that very few people seem to know anything at all about it, sadly. And this general lack of understanding was clearly illustrated when I recently shared a photo of my parrot eating a chicken wing. Now, I've always fed my bird responsibly. His bowl has a blend of two different types of proper parrot food in it. I also give him fruits and nuts as snacks when he wants them, and sometimes even crackers. But occasionally, and not very often, I may share table scraps with him too, because he's very insistent that I share. Parrots are omnivorous, just like we are. They'll often eat bugs when they can get them, and it's natural for him to eat a little bit of meat on occasion. So it's fine if I let him clean a couple chicken bones every now and again. And this video was inspired by reactions people had at watching a bird eating another bird. Several people said that that was cannibalism. And one guy said it was like watching a cow eating beef. There are many different types or breeds of cattle that qualify as beef, and they're variants of the same species, Bos taurus. And there are many different species of cattle, too, in more than one genus. Varieties that have grown so far apart, physically and genetically, that either they won't interbreed anymore under normal circumstances, or their chances of producing fertile or even viable hybrids dwindle down to none. That's what speciation is, according to the biological species concept for sexually reproductive animals. It's the most significant distinction in taxonomy because that's where microevolution becomes macroevolution, at the evolutionary origin of species, when the ancestral gene pool no longer inhibits novel traits in the new variety. So maybe this guy, who, who, who thought that, that, that the parrots eating chickens is cannibalism, maybe he thought that that parrots and chickens and maybe all other birds too are all part of the same species, different variants of the same species, and that the name of their species is bird. When Carolus Linnaeus first devised his natural system of taxonomy way back in 1735, he put all of the vertebrate animals into one of five categories, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. If it has a backbone, it goes in one of these five categories. Now, the system he devised doesn't really work anymore, not with all we know now, so there have been some corrections, revisions, and refinements since the 18th century. For example, in recent decades we've discovered that birds could be a subset of both reptiles and fish, depending on how you define either of those terms. So the words reptile and fish don't mean anything anymore, at least not for cladistic classification, where we might say seropsid or vertebrate instead. The point is that bird is not a species and neither is fish. Every Thursday I take Pudge the fish a peanut butter sandwich. Pudge is a fish? And today we are out of peanut butter. I asked my sister what to give him and she said a tuna sandwich. I can't give Pudge tuna. Do you know what tuna is? Fish? It's fish! If I gave Pudge tuna, I'd be an abomination. Fish eat other fish, and birds eat other birds. It's only cannibalism when it's the same species. We all accept that a wolf and a sheep are different species, even though they're both mammals. Again, it has a bird. It's not very recognizable anymore without the feathers, but it is a bird. Another bird. And this isn't cannibalism, contrary to popular belief, uh, because they're eating uh, birds in a completely different family, completely different genus, everything than what they're in. In Linnaean taxonomy, birds, fish, mammal, and reptile are all traditionally class-level ancestral categories encompassing many taxonomic families, each with multiple genera, dividing into myriad species and subspecies, and so on. And each class collectively accounts for thousands and thousands of known species, if not millions, if we could include all of the fossil forms. Now, I suspect that most people have no idea of the concept of biodiversity, of the vast variety of animals that are alive today, to say nothing of the multitudes more in the fossil record or how they're all related, which is why they don't understand or accept evolution. So I thought I'd make a video to compare just how far apart these species really are. My parrot is a yellow-headed Amazon. The most closely related species to him is probably the yellow-naped Amazon or the St. Lucia Amazon. But there are more than 30 other species of parrots just in the genus Amazona. Compare that to humans, where there is only one surviving species and no more than a dozen or so fossil species in the same genus, Homo. The genus Amazona is one of seven within the tribe Androclacini. 
Their sister tribe, Arini, includes macaws, parakeets, and conures. These two tribes belong to the subfamily Araneae, which accounts for about 150 species of neotropical parrots. Their sister group, Cetacinae, is the subfamily of African parrots. These include two species of gray parrot in the genus Cetacus and ten other species in the genus Poicephalus. Araneae and Cetacinae are both subsets of the family Cetacidae. And there are two other families of varied derivations of Old World parrots, and those three families account for some 350 different species of true parrots within the taxonomic superfamily Cetacoidea. And then there are offshoots, too, other families, including 21 species of cockatoos in and around Australia, as well as a handful more species of New Zealand parrots isolated on the other side of the Tasman Sea, some 1,300 miles further east. Collectively, all of these are cetaciforms, which basically means parrots, even though it includes budgies and lorikeets, cockatiels, and so on. And traditionally, some people might not recognize parakeets as parrots, but they are a subset of the parrot superfamily. Just like we don't traditionally say that people are apes, but we are part of the ape superfamily. And we're monkeys, too, for the same reason that budgies are parrots. And there were some fossil groups here. The first cetaciforms were preceded by some parrot-like not-quite parrots over 50 million years ago, and they were evidently carnivorous, though it's hard to tell. My parrot has the beak and talons of a raptor, and he seems to think that he's an eagle in living color. Originally, taxonomy was done by morphology, comparing definitive physical characteristics. Usually that's all that can be done in paleontology. However, we can now trace evolution genetically to show how existing species are related. So for much of this video, I will refer to a comprehensive phylogeny of birds, the most comprehensive avian tree of life, published in Nature in 2015 by ornithologists using targeted next-generation DNA sequencing from 198 species of living birds, representing all major avian lineages and two crocodilian outgroups. Because we don't have any dinosaurs left other than birds, crocodiles are their closest living relatives, and we have to have the closest possible outgroup for genetic perspective. What this phylogeny confirms that morphology had already determined is that parrots are most closely related to songbirds. Remember, there are three families of parrots amounting to almost 400 living species. You compare that to 140 families of songbirds amounting to 6,500 species. And that's just the ones that are still alive, because there are an awful lot of fossil forms, too. The common ancestor of parrots and songbirds looked a bit like the most primitive forms of both and was evidently carnivorous. And parrots are also closely related to falcons, birds that eat birds, and they are quite parrot-like. Not only do they look it, but their genome proves it. That's how evolution works, through a series of incremental superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarity. You start with an ancestral form, a bird that is similar to, yet indistinct from, parrots or falcons and a wide variety of songbirds. And remember that nothing is static. Every individual in every generation is slightly different from each of its siblings, owing to constantly occurring mutations, so that different sets of that bird's descendants eventually differentiate into increasingly distinct groups in a process that is never ending until that lineage goes extinct. So there was once a single ancient genus that was the common ancestor of all australates, that's falcons, parrots, and songbirds, and caryomiforms. Way back in the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction 66 million some odd years ago, when the other dinosaurs died out and before any of these other modern bird groups diversified into their now distinct clades, caryomiforms had already differentiated. Now, some of them grew much too big to fly and resumed their ancestral role as fast-running predatory dinosaurs all over again. They became the terror birds, because if they were still alive and we encountered them in the wild, they would be terrifying, especially if they hunt in a flock. Or should we call that a murder? The only surviving caryomiforms are four species of the genus Ceriamus in South America. And from this last genus, they got the DNA to test the rest. The sister group of Australaves is Afroaves. That's all the uniquely African birds, as well as hawks, eagles, vultures, and also owls, which reversed two toes. Remember that most birds have three forward and one back, but owls and parrots both have two forward and two back. The same change happened independently in both groups. On either group, if you look at their feet, you can see they weren't created that way. That's a toe that used to be pointed forward and is now bent around the other way. 
Evolution is descent with inherent modification, and that's obviously an inherited trait, not an intelligent design. It certainly wasn't intentional. In this illustration, a mere 75 thumbnails represent some 10,000 known species of living birds. This chart also marks a couple hundred significant divisions, where one ancestral group begat two daughter sets, and those two became four, and then eight, and sixteen, and so on. But now we're talking about divisions that happened before the KT extinction, when the other dinosaurs were still around, and there were several orders of Cretaceous birds that never made it out of that age. They went extinct, along with the other dinosaurs. But this study shows that at least two or three clays of birds survived that event and radiated from there, filling the void that the other dinosaurs left behind. The study that this illustration comes from describes five major clades forming successive sister groups to the rest of Neoaves. One, a clade including nightjars, other caprimulgiforms, swifts, and hummingbirds. Two, a clade uniting cuckoos, bustards, turacos with pigeons, mesites, and sangrouse. Three, cranes and their relatives. Four, a comprehensive waterbird clade including all diving, wading, and shorebirds. And five, a comprehensive landbird clade, which is the one to which my parrot belongs. They identified the enigmatic Hotson as a sister group to the rest. Now, these are birds that have an atavism in their infancy, wherein they retain functioning fingers in their wings that were lost in all other birds. They were lost in Hotsons, too. As they mature, their fingers are reabsorbed into their avian wings. And this is an example of an evolutionary principle called evo-devo, where patterns of evolutionary development may be recapitulated in embryological development. And some neo-waves have a single vestigial claw that is the only remnant of their ancestral fingers. Ratites, like ostriches and emus, still have their fingers, but they can't use them anymore because they no longer have the necessary musculature. Yet another vestigial trait and an example of unintelligent design. Early flying birds had three functional grasping fingers in their wings, just like velociraptors, which are very closely related to birds, but are not birds. Most true birds eventually lost their fingers because they could fly, and having flight-capable wings rendered any finger use extremely awkward and impractical, if not impossible. So the three avian clades to survive the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction are divided into two groups. The first division, the, what would become all modern birds, was between Paleonase and Neonase, essentially old birds and new birds, because most of the Paleonase did as the terror birds did. They got too big to fly and they still look like typical dinosaurs. The Neonase are divided into two groups too. Neoaves, which we just talked about, and Gallo and Sere, essentially ducks and chickens, and turkeys and geese and that sort of thing. That was only the second division out of all of the diversity among modern birds. Whereas the point where parrots became parrots as distinguished from songbirds is the 12th degree of separation. And the point where chickens become chickens as distinguished from a grouse, according to this chart, is the 181st division. So chickens and parrots are not the same species, not even close. In fact, the only way these two birds could be any more distantly related is if one of them was an ostrich. And someone who saw the picture of my parrot eating a chicken wing compared that to a human eating a chimpanzee. But chimps are the closest living species to our own, and we diverged from our common ancestor with them only six million years ago. So we're like 12 million years apart from them by now, each going our separate ways. But it turns out that the lineage that led to Gallus domesticus and the one that eventually led to Amazona oratrix is separated by 140 million years, having diverged some 70 million years ago. So parrots and chickens are actually significantly more distantly related to each other than humans are to any other species of monkey.